science setters, welcome to it, grade tens, to your life sciences show. I am Looney and that is Aslam. How are you? Hey, Looney, grade <laughs> ten. It's a bit early yeah, for me. It's all, yeah, it's all so weird if, saying if, Aslam if, at four o'clock. If, if no. I'm not awake, then you know, you must just give me a, 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 a bump. <laughs> no, that's fine. Mine setters, <laughs> as you can see, I've got a very special guest with me in studio today, Raven. How are you? I'm okay, Nisa. I'm good, thanks. Super. She is one of South Africa's most youngest scientists. Scientist. So tell yes. us about yourself. Um, Raven is an aspiring microbiologist. Um, I study all the small stuff. Um, I'm currently doing my master's in biology at the Northwest University. That is cool. So Raven entered a competition. So you c can you tell the mindsetters at home more about the competition? Sure. Um, the competition is called Fame Lab. It's a science communication um, competition. It's basically saying, can you be a scientist and communicate your science to a normal person? Um, it involves being given three minutes to discuss any scientific topic, no matter how complicated. But the catch is you need to be able to communicate it to people who've never done science before. Oh, that is so cool. Mm -hmm. So what did you end up presenting on? I'm actually presented on viruses, how viruses work, how they invade your body, and what we as scientists do to keep viruses away from your body and how we tackle them. Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. So for all the mindsetters at home who want to be scientists or in interested in biology, do you have any words of inspiration for them, H how they can go about it, what they yeah. can do, what subjects they need to be studying at school and all of that stuff? Yeah, you know, um, a lot of people think that science is difficult. And it's not so difficult once you find your passion for it. So I'd say keep going. I know it seems hard sometimes, but keep pushing through. Sometimes um, the next open door is disguised as a wall. So just have the courage to break through that wall and do your best. All right, cool. Mindset is I hope you guys have learned something from Raven. And you'll be inspired. And you'll also want, they want to become a scientist and do these awesome, awesome things. But remember, guys, you can hit us up on Facebook, Twitter, and on our website, Facebook, it's facebook.com forward slash learn extra. On Twitter, we are on at learn extra. And then you can download the show notes, the videos, and the schedules on learn.mindset.co.za. And remember, guys, if you want to see more of Raven, you can also tune into the Grade 11 show because we'll be here in studio helping us out with Aslam because Aslam's going to be here for the whole three hours. Whole three hours, can you believe it? <laughs> Remember, you can also win this awesome, awesome calculator from Test Yourself. All you need to do is complete the Test Yourself questions from the entry form. I will post all the information on our Facebook page. But right now, Aslam, if you can just... Move on. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you were asking Raven uh, <laughs> if he got some uh, inspirational words. Yeah. Mindset is that you don't need inspirational words from a youngster that's standing in front of you. Him standing in front of you is proof that you, me, Looney, we can all make it out there. Yes. We just got to put our mind to what we are doing, be passionate, as Raven has told you, and go for it. Knock that wall down if you have to. Just not, don't be driving while you're doing no knocking those walls down. But other than that, you put your mind to anything, you are capable of reaching all the stars. Not just these stars, but all the stars. Yes. Let's talk about what we're doing today, guys. What are we doing? We're dealing with transpiration, and oh, first of all, I must apologize to you, grade 10 mindsetters. You're seeing less of Cheryl and more of Aslam, the crazy one. Sorry about that, but unfortunately, for today, for this hour, you are stuck with me, and I am stuck with you, so let's make it happen. We're talking about transpiration, and by now, grade 10s, you should know what transpiration is, but we're going to talk more about it as we go along. What are we going to actually look at? <coughs> We're looking at the uptake of water. Uh, let's change the color there. The uptake of water. Uptake of water, uh, the movement of water up a plant and mineral salts by the roots. So first of all, the roots getting this water and mineral salts. And then we want to talk about how the water and the mineral salts move up the xylem. You've already learned the plant tissues and xylem is that plant tissue that transports water in a plant from the roots to the leaves. So first we're looking at how does water get from the soil to the roots. And once it's in the roots, how does it go up a plant in the xylem? That's the first part of our uh, lesson.
Then we're looking at the relationship between water loss and structure of the leaf. In other words, how is the leaf suited mainly to reduce water loss? In some cases, you must understand the leaf can also be suited to promote water loss. And we'll ask those questions later. Good. I'm hoping we're together great tens. You know, with me, you've got to be on the ball all the time. Because Looney will tell you I talk a lot. And Looney, talking of which, mm. Raven told us that he won the competition mm -hmm. to communicate science. Mm. to people. Yes. I think I would have won the thing if he told me. Eh? <laughs> unfair, unfair. <laughs> if anybody can talk, it's me. Eh? Well, okay, I, I talk a lot of nonsense, but that's the <laughs> problem. Maybe that wouldn't have won the competition. Well, eh? I don't nonsense so. doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> Challenge question, guys. A very straightforward, but something that you need to think about. I want to change it slightly. What factors affect the rate of transpiration? I want to change it to add a twist to it. What factors increase Oops. increase the rate of transpiration? So when you're working this thing out, first and foremost, just write down very quickly the factors that affect the rate of transpiration. From that list that you've written down, I want you to choose those that increase the rate of transpiration. That's going to make it a little more challenging. Good. Let's move on. The work that we're doing is very simple, guys. This is, there's a lot of logic involved in what we are going to do now. First of all, you obviously need to know the structure of the different parts of the plant. That's the first thing you need to know to understand it. You also need to know this concept called osmosis and the other one called diffusion, which you've already done in preceding lessons. For those of you who don't understand the word preceding, the ones before today, okay? We need to explain all these things, especially to your, your generation, Nuni. They are a bit slow on vocab <laughs> because their vocab is more on the yeah, texting, the B -A BBM and WhatsApp and Facebook. The uptake of water and minerals by the root. The, so the first part of the story, this is a story. Think of it as a big story. The first story starts downstairs. Where's downstairs? at the roots of the plant and the soil, obviously. Remember, in the soil, there is water. Now, there's two types of water in the soil. Now, this is not for exam purposes, but so that you understand. There is water in the soil that's found in the spaces between the soil particles. In other words, what we are saying here, if that's the soil particles, in between, there's water there. There's also water around the soil particles themselves. In other words, it is like stuck to the soil particles because the water molecule is adhering to that. Now, adhering here, not is like adhering to the roots, but adhering in the same stuck to the soil particle because of adhesive properties. When water molecules bond with other particles, like for example the container in which they are found. In this glass, for example, you do all know that water does not have shape. But the minute we put it into this container, it has shape now. The shape of the container. Why? Because the water molecules are clinging to the, in this case, the inside of this glass. So it gives it shape. We can obviously alter that shape by moving the water around and the rest of it. But this is what we mean by adhesive properties of water. We also know that when you go to the tap, and if you want to take water out, you can't say, Luni, give me one molecule water for me, one molecule for you. When you open the tap, uh, yeah. water comes out. Even when you close the tap and you put tissue under that, it tends to pull the water. What has happened there? The water is sticking to the tissue paper. Behind that water molecule, there are other water molecules. So these water molecules in front, when they get pulled by the tissue, they pull the other ones with it. You know, like in getting in trouble in school. When you get into trouble, you want to take all your friends with mm. you. You get those type <laughs> of pupils, and then you get those pupils that, you know what, I will go down myself. I'm the hero. I will go down. I will take the fall for everybody. Those are the dumb ones. <laughs> yeah. 
You rather let everybody share yes, your problems. Yes, it's more fun don't when everyone is Exactly. <laughs> don't be a hero. You think you're a hero, you're not a hero. You're a zero. Right. Okay, so that's what's happening there. Let's move on. The water, movement of water and minerals in a root and through the plant is caused by two main processes, which we mentioned earlier, that is diffusion and not osmoasis, but osmosis, right? That A must come out there. Good? Now let's understand what's happening. I told you that between the soil particles, there's this water called capillary water. Again, not for exam purposes capillary water. So there's more water in the soil and less water in the plant, in the root. You must also remember that the soil is a huge structure. The land, the ground, compared to the root, which is a small structure. So obviously, even a little water in the soil is more than a little water in the root because of the size difference. So we say that the soil water has a higher water potential. Notice we do not use the word concentration, although some textbooks use it. It is better to talk about water potential, which is the ability of water to move by osmosis or to do work by osmosis. Water potential, your potential, your ability. So the same way, water has a potential to move from A to B depending on where there's more water molecules. When we use concentrated, we can start confusing concentrated solution and dilute solution. So let's uh, steer away from that. So your water potential in the vacuoles of the root. So what's going to happen? There's a water potential gradient. There is uphill and downhill here now. High water potential and low water potential. Here we're having high water potential there. Let's use the blue now. High water potential there and lower water potential in the vacuole. So therefore the water will move from the soil, through the cell wall, through the cell membrane, through the tonoplast of the vacuole, into the vacuole. So the water collects in the vacuole because the vacuole stores the water. And as you can see in the other one, it's there as well. We'll talk about that as we go along. So the water moves from the soil through the thin cell wall and the differentially permeable cell membrane into the vacuole of the root by osmosis. Picture this instead of remembering that. Picture this in the terms of the diagram. Mineral salts are absorbed against concentration gradient. That means in the case of mineral salts, because there's even a little mineral salt inside the root, the outside has a, 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 a lower uh, concentration. Why? Because now the outside has lots of water and less mineral salts in that sense. So now what happens? They are actively absorbed. And for this, we need energy. Active in, uh, absorption means against the concentra concentration gradient. In other words, it's like moving uphill. And for going uphill, you need more energy. If you go downhill, you'll roll naturally down. Okay? Think of a rock that's at the bottom of the hill, and you need to take it up, and the rock that's on top of the hill, and you need to bring it down. You figure out that one. The water potential in the vacuole is now higher in the root hair than the adjacent parenchyma in the cortex. Here's your cortex area here now. So this one here has a lower water potential. This one has a higher water potential. So obviously water will move from that cell to the next. And so it will move from cell to cell eventually. We'll talk about other movement just now. Until it gets to the xylem in the central cylinder of the root. Now the upward, or sorry, the sideways movements first to get to that area. We talk of the apoplast pathway and the symplast pathway. The apoplast means that the water will move through the cell walls and intercellular spaces. Whereas the symplasty moves from cell to cell directly. Cell to cell that is. <coughs> Let's go back to our diagram. If these were cells, parenchyma cells, parenchyma cells, if water moves either through the spaces and then goes to other cells, and the other one is saying water moves from this cell through the cell membranes through the other one. That's what we are talking about there. So you're talking about your ap apoplasty and the symplasty there. And here is it shown in a diagram, your, this solid white line going in between the spaces there. 
That's your apoplasty. And when you're going from cell to cell to cell to cell to cell to cell, to cell that's called symplasty. The upward movement, there's few movements there, capillarity, root pressure, and transpiration pull. These are the three ways in which water will move up. So first of all, we spoke about absorption of water from the soil to the root, uh, from, to the root hair. From the root hair to the xylem, it's a lateral movement, it's sideway movement. Symplasty, apoplasty. And last, we spoke about now, how does this water go up? There are three ways, capillarity, root pressure, transpiration pull. When we come back after the break, we will look at these things in a little more detail. All right, mindsetters, let's take a very quick break. We'll see you straight after this. Welcome back, mindsetters, from my break. I'm not going to talk and waste your time and go on and on mm. about life and everything. I'll take you straight back to Asla. Ah, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Thank you very much, man. <laughs> That's very good of you to help us out so much with the time. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so when we ended, we spoke about root pressure, capillarity, and transpiration. In other words, now that we've got this water in the xylem, it must go up. And remember, some plants are shrubs. It's so small. Some are smaller than this even. And then you get other plants that are very tall, 10 meters, 15 meters, 20 meters. How does water get from the bottom of the root, which may be deep also, it may not be on the surface, right to the tip of the tree, because every part of the tree needs water. So how does it get there? This is the three ways in which it gets there. The first one is called root pressure. This is the pressure that's created in the root because of incoming water. If this is the root, there is some water here. Let's use the blue. It looks exciting when we use blue. There is some water in it. And here some other water comes into that. So what's going to happen to that water? That water is there. More water is coming in. This water gets displaced. And which way can it go? It can only go upwards. So this is the force. As water comes in, it pushes the water that's already in a xylem upwards. And you're getting a root pressure. Unfortunately, it accounts for up, up to about 30 centimeters. 30 centimeters is the size of your ruler. A big ruler, obviously. And, and I just told you now, some plants are 10 meters. So root pressure, although it's there, it can't account for large-scale movement of water up a plant. The next force is called capillarity. Now, you've all been to the restaurant and you're having some cold drink or even in, in, in your cans, when you're buying cans, you put your straw inside the cold drink. You'll notice, I'm not sure whether you'll be able to see much of this, but you will notice, I'm just giving you the idea and you can try this at home, it's very easy, with your cold drink. Put the straw in, you'll notice that in the glass, the level of the water or the cold drink or the juice is less than that in the thin straw. This demonstrates capillarity very nicely because capillarity is the spontaneous movement, automatic, spontaneous, without pushing. Spont because nobody pushed that water up the straw. Yes, if you want it to get into your mouth, you're going to pull it. But you do notice that in the straw, there's always a level that is higher than what's in a can or in a glass, <coughs> even if it's cold drink. Hmm? So this is capillarity. How does it work? As the water goes up this tube with fine uh, diameter, the water pushes it up. The water itself pushes it up. Why? Because of two important forces that I was talking about earlier. The adhesion and cohesion factors or forces. Adhesion is where the water molecules will stick to the sides. So they're going to, to stick to the sides of the straw. And because it's narrower, the, tube, the water goes further, I mean, the water, sorry. At the same time, as one molecule is going up that fine tube, what does it do to the others? Hey, come with. I'm not going alone. Cohesion. Co, two. Cohesion, adhesion to stick. Adhesive, glue. Adhesive, glue. So when a water molecule uh, 
sticks to the container in which it's found or the tube. This is adhesive forces that keeps it there. And the cohesive forces is the forces that exist between water molecules themselves. This cohesive property of water makes sure that water is actually a very strong, powerful, it has lots of pressure, water, because the water molecules cling together. So that's what's happening there, and this is what we tried to show you in that little uh, demonstration there. If we had uh, a water trough and we had two tubes of different diameters, we'll find that the water will rise up higher in the one that is narrower, that has a finer bore. Now in the plant, it has xylem, which has fine, and xylem has trachees and vessels which are narrow, so it pushes this water up. This tool also, you can see from your straw experiment that I'm talking about, it doesn't push the cold ring out of the straw. It pushes it up the straw, not far up. So it's also a very small force. So these two forces together, they won't push the water right up. And then the third force we said was transpiration pull. This is the force that's created at the tip of the plant or at the leaf end. Why? Because water is being lost by transpiration. Transpiration is the loss of water in the form of water vapor from the leaves, mainly. From the aerial parts of the plant, it can also transpire from the top of the stem as well, but mainly from the leaves. Water leaves from the leaves more, from the stomata, you would have learned that already. So when that happens, what did we talk about water just now? It has strong cohesive properties and adhesive properties. So if there's water leaving from the top. What does it do to water that's still in a leaf? It's going to pull it. Cohesion. And the water in the xylem of the leaf is then going to pull the water from the stem of the leaf. And the water from the stem of the leaf in the xylem will pull the water from the xylem of the root. So this, people, is the strongest force. And what are we talking about? Transpiration pull. So in other words, there's a pulling force. Uh, Luni, if it gets too close to my mouth, you better tell me. If I swallow mm. the water, you die. No, please. <laughs> okay. Ah, there, I, I did mess it up. I'm trying a trick. It's not going to work. All right. My, my breath is not <laughs> good enough to lift this thing up there. But you know what you do when you are with a straw. Maybe I'll get it right with this one. Who knows? Let's try. <laughs> Almost. Here you can see it clearly. With a little, without much, and notice now another thing that ha uh, accidental signs this is called. Mm. Notice that the, the pipette I was using was wider than this pipe. So it was very difficult for me to pull the water up that pipette. Mm -hmm. But see how quickly the water came, came up here. Yeah. This also demonstrates that capillarity helped me in this process. Because this is a narrow tube, the water rose on this thing here quicker. Can you see the water is up? You can see the blue in this one here. I'm sure you can see it on your screen as well. So by pulling, when I'm pulling on the top here, water is being pulled from the bottom. This is called transpiration pull. Not, wa not what I did. <laughs> that's not transpiration pull. That's me pulling the water. Transpiration is pull, uh, pull is when the plant itself is over. There's a root pressure demonstration. When the soil pushes water into the root, the root will push that water up a little bit. Okay? This is an experiment to demonstrate. What we do in this case, we cut off the leaves, etc. We leave the root inside. We put a glass tube like we've done there. And you will see water going up the tube. This demonstrates root pressure. Hmm? So the observation is when you see the water going up. The conclusion? root pressure does have a force to push water up. And the other one I showed you, capillarity, and this is your transpiration pool now. When the leaf is used, losing water here by transpiration, there, let's use yellow now again. Here in this area, transpiration is taking place. This water pulls the one behind it, and that one pulls the one behind it, and so on. It goes on like that, and it's going to pull this water. This is called transpiration pull. This is the most effective force to take water up a plant. And to show you a, de a demonstration, there we have the demonstration here. Without 
a plant, you may not see much moisture on this container, whereas with a plant with leaves, we can show that the leaves are the most important part. We can even change this by putting a plant in without leaves to show that the leaves contribute more to transpiration than the other parts of the plant as well. Okay? All right, I've explained this whole story about the uh, water moving up there. We're not going to go into that one there. Another experiment uh, the uh, syllabus sometimes prescribe is this transpiration pool where we use a plant in a measuring cylinder and we have a tube going down in the bottom in the beaker, we have mercury. The purpose of using mercury in this experiment is to show that transpiration pool is a strong force. Also, a precaution would be to be careful when you're working with mercury because mercury is poisonous. Secondly, you must also follow certain precautions when cutting this plant. It must be cut underwater, it must be cut at an angle, it must be cut with a sharp knife, etc. You can uh, read up the reasons for those as you're going along. That's that one there. Uh, the last one, talking about the structural adaptation of leaves for transpiration. Uh, you must know that obviously to reduce transpiration, the leaf can have a thick waxy cuticle, it can have a sunken stomata, the leaves can be reduced in size, the leaves can have hair or tendrils to trap air around it. These are some of the structural suitabilities of the leaf for losing water. Sunken stomata, thickness of the cuticle, hair on the leaves, the smaller leaf surface, Sometimes the leaves are uh, modified to form thorns. The arrangement, like in the moss plant, the leaves are arranged in a rosette, so the top leaves get the sunlight, the, below, the leaves at the bottom don't get sunlight, so they don't lose too much of water, etc. Those are some of the things. The factors that affect uh, transpiration, these are temperature, light intensity, wind, and humidity, mainly environmental factors. Remember, the first part we were talking about was the plant factors. Now we're talking about environmental factors. Temperature, obviously the hot it is, do you sweat more or do you sweat less? Sweat more. You sweat more. So what's, what's happening to the plant? It's going to transpire <coughs> more. So heat, uh, higher temperatures will increase the rate of transpiration, and lower temperatures will decrease the rate of transpiration. In uh, light intensity, because more photosynthesis is taking place in brighter light, the, uh, the stomata stay open and more uh, water is lost. When it is dimmer, less water will be lost. Wind, obviously, moderate winds increase the rate of transpiration. But if the winds get too strong, the plant starts figuring I'm losing too much of water, stomata closes up, and high winds will decrease the rate of transpiration eventually. Humidity is the amount of moisture in the air Obviously, if there's more moist, when you're in Durban, for example, Luni, or you're in Joburg, and the temperature is 40 degrees, where will you feel more comfortable? Now, don't think about swimming in the beach. No. If you can't swim in the beach, you're just there, but you can't go into the water. You're too scared. There's too many sharks. So where will you feel more comfortable, in Durban or Josie? Joburg. In Joburg. Why? Because it's hotter and drier in Joburg. Mm. So your sweat evaporates quickly. <laughs> Whereas in Durban, your sweat stays on you. Yeah. You feel hot and bothered and sticky, sticky because the humidity is higher in Durban, so the rate of evaporation is less. So the same thing happens in, uh, in, in transpiration. Think about it in that way or even think about it about drying your clothes on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a washing line. If you're putting there, when will your clothes get drier quicker on all these factors? You, if you compare those things to each other, it will make more sense to you. And obviously soil water, if there's lots of water in the soil, the transpiration rate will increase, and if there's less water, the transpiration rate will be slower. A photometer is an instrument that is used to uh, measure the rate of transpiration. The more famous one is this one at the bottom here, where we introduce an air bubble by lifting this tube out of the water. This is a beaker of water. We let the air bubble go to a point. We can use, some are calibrated, that means they have measurements, you can take it to zero. And as the plant loses water here, it pulls this air bubble. So we can measure how far this air bubble goes over time. And we can move this instrument around. We can keep it in a cold area, fridge. 
We can create wind by using a fan. We can wrap this thing around with a plastic bag so it becomes humid inside there. Or we can put it next to a heater so we create heat. We can use a bright bulb for bright conditions and we can move it away from the bright bulb for dim conditions. So we can set this apparatus up and we can do it. This is a very simple one. This is a more specialized photometer. So these are the things that you can do to measure the rate of transpiration. And guttation, sometimes the humidity is very high, so transpiration is not taking place, and there's a lot of soil water. That means it's raining and it's humid. So what happens, you'll find that a plant loses water from the margins of the leaf from pores known as hydrothodes in the form of water. Transpiration, water vapor. Guttation, water droplets. As you can see there, water droplets. This is known as uh, guttations. The hydrothodes are the pores that are found there. Uh, food is moved in a plant from the phloem, from the leaf, because it's produced in a leaf photosynthesis, from the leaf to all parts of the uh, plant body. It will move via the flume. We're not going to go into details of how that happens. You can read that up. Straight into the questions, and I'm sure we can finish one question before the break, and then we'll take the others as we go along. Study the diagram below and answer the questions that follow. There they're giving you a diagram. They have the letters A to D from, left, from right to left, and they have the numbers 1, 2, 6, also from right to left on the top. They're telling you there's film of water and there's soil particles there, and they're showing you the water pathway by means of arrows. Provide labels for the region 3, region 3, and tissue 2. Region 3 is this area here of the root. Remember, this whole thing is of the diagram of the root. This area here, there's the root here. Here's your xylem area. So what is region 3? Region 3 would be the cortex. And tissue 2, this tissue here, notice where is it? What's coming out of the one next to it? A root hair. So that has to be the, you guessed it, right? Epidermis. Describe one function of part four. What is part four? This area here, just before we move in to the uh, steel or the xylem end, is known as the Casparian strip. Casparian strip. And the Casparian strip ensures that water is directed to the xylem. Remember, we want water to go to the xylem. Why? Because the xylem will take this water up. So if the water goes to the flume, flume is living cells. They're going to use some of the water. Xylem is dead cells, lignified cells. They're not going to use the water, so they're going to do, they work like a hose pipe. Take water from point A to point B. So the Casparian strip helps in that way. Identify structure one, state its function, and explain two ways in which the structure is adapted. Notice in this particular question, there's three parts to it. First, you have to identify it. We would normally separate it. State its function and explain two ways in which it's adapted for its function. Uh, structure one. Structure one, where's, all right. Structure one is pointing to the root hair. So first is the root hair. <coughs> root hair. <coughs> now, the function of the root is to absorb water. We can't use that for the root hair. What does the root hair do? It increases the surface area for the absorption of water. And how is it suited for this function? Number one, this elongated, and there are many, so this will increase the surface area. Number two, it has a thin cell wall to allow water to pass through easily. Number three, it has a large vacuole which can ensure that the water potential is low and at the same time it can store water. We will stop at that question when we come back after the break. We will deal with the questions and your questions and the challenge questions. All right. Mindset says congratulations goes to 
Shongile, hope for winning this awesome, awesome Casio calculator. Congratulations to you, Shongile. I hope you do enjoy this awesome prize because it's such an amazing thing to have. Remember, guys, if you want to be like Shongile and win a calculator, all you need to do is enter the test yourself competition. I did post all our, I will post all our information about the competition on the Facebook page. So do make sure you check that out. And remember, guys, if you don't get through all your questions right at the end of the show, we do have a Learn Extra help desk, and the Life Sciences help desk is proudly brought to you by Excel. So please make sure you make use of that. It's learn.mindset.co.za forward slash help desk. Send all your questions through there if we don't get through them right at the end of the show. But right now, we are going to take a very quick break, so don't go anywhere. We'll see you right now. Welcome back, Mindsetters. We are in our last segment for grade 10, Life Sciences. I hope you guys are enjoying the show. I won't waste your time because Aslam has 10 questions, everything, everything, everything. Thank you, Luni. <laughs> Thank you, Luni. You <laughs> are being so helpful today, man. <laughs> Describe the three forces which develop in a cell's D to assist water to travel up the stem. I'm not going to describe them. I'm going to name them. And we have described them before the break when we were dealing with the summary, so you can elaborate on it. Remember, it says the important thing is that you must pick up on this, describe. This question can be worth up to 9 to 10 marks. So you can't just say root, pressure, capillarity, and transpiration pull. That will earn you three marks, though. So if you don't know how to describe it, at least write those things down, because that's going to give you three marks. Don't say, Ish, I don't know how to describe this, so let me leave it out. It's three marks at least to, to name these things. And then by giving simple descriptions, what is root pressure, what is capillarity, and what is transpiration pool, you'll get more marks. So you've got to look at the mark allocations here when they're given in an exam paper. If the mark allocation is nine, a mere description of each of these, a very simple description will get you those nine marks. If it's more than that, it can even go to an essay, a mini essay where they're giving you 20 marks for it. Now, what must you do in this mini essay? You've got to re read, first of all, in this case, it said describe what the three forces which developed there. And which are they there? We've done it. So you take one force, you explain that force or describe it, sorry, not explain, describe that force. Then you go to the next one and the next one and the next one. And that will give you your marks. Remember in a mini essay in life science, it's about the facts. Out of the 20 marks, 17 marks are given for the facts and three marks are given for synthesis. The synthesis is not a heading that you have to write down synthesis and write something. The synthesis is which in which I, the marker, when I'm marking your essay, I make a decision on three things. One is on the relevance of your essay. One is on the logical flow. And the third one is on the comprehensiveness. The first one is easy relevance. That means it must be relevant to what I'm asking you. If I've asked you about these three forces and you start talking about uh, uh, the phloem and the xylem and the suitability, nobody asks you for that. So you lose the one mark for relevance. Logical flow, in this particular case, I would start with root pressure, go to capillarity, and go to transpiration pool to show the flow of the water as well. Mind the pun on flow and flow of water, all right? Okay. That will be your logical flow. Comprehensiveness, because we're asking you for three forces. If you only discuss two forces, you don't get comprehensive. Comprehensive means you have answered the question. It doesn't mean you have to have all the facts. There'd be some minimum criteria that at least you've mentioned all the three and described a few of them. Okay? It doesn't mean that you have to get 17 marks to get that one mark. It simply means you've answered the question. Doesn't mean it's correct, but it must be answered according to what we are asking you for. There, there'll be a minimum. If you want to, look at the grade 12 paper and see what the synthesis mark is all about, especially since last year, 2013 November, and. 2014 March. Look at the synthesis, see how the synthesis is allocated, and you will learn. So that answers, Luni, one of our questions about mini essays. Okay. Using an answer there, right? All right. Okay. Describe two adaptations of the cells labeled six. <coughs> six. All right. That's the xylem vessel, the xylem story there. And we, in other words, you must talk of the xylem and how it is suited. And here I'm going to give you certain pointers. You will fill in the blanks. One is that they are lignified. 
and thicken. Now, you don't stop there. You say, describe to a deaf patient. There are lists. If they say list, you can say lignify, thicken, and you carry on from there. Now, what does lignified and thicken means that this thing can transport water and withstand pressure. So the walls are lignified to give it strength. It is thickened in a variety of ways to give it strength and support. Mainly, the contents are non-living, so it will not use the water. Further than that, they are stacked end to end. In other words, if this is one vessel, another one will be on top, one on, and this creates a hollow conducting tube for water to go through. So those are some of your answers for this question. You can also talk about the cross walls that have disappeared to allow it to be like a host pipe. Don't say like a host pipe, but you know what I'm saying, I hope. What type of pathway of movement is indicated by the arrows? The arrows are going what? From <coughs> cell to cell to cell to cell. So that is symplasty. Remember the two were apoplasty. Now notice, when you're using the word cell to cell to cell to cell, the S sound is prominent. So cell to cell to cell, symplasty. And in between the spaces, apoplasty. Air spaces, apoplasty. So you won't forget. I mean, sometimes to remember apoplasty, symplasty, you know, exam, hot, which one is which, you start forgetting it. So try and make associations with it. And I've given you one such association. You can make your own there. Right? We've answered that one. I want to jump. I'll come back to this just now. Let's do the challenge question first. What factors affect the rate of transpiration? Now, if you were listening carefully, you would have picked it up. And I would rather say what environmental, environmental factors, number one, and that is temperature, light, wind, humidity, and we can add soil water as well. The one on top, the four on top rather, these are the more famous ones. Now my question went a step further to say, what was it? Which of these factors increase? Now some of you may have thought, ah, oh, we can select from here. No, it's not that easy. Within these things, some increase and some decrease. So green for go, I'm going to say increase. Temperature on its own, does it increase or decrease? You can't say. If you say high temperature, will increase the rate of transpiration. Light, bright light. Humidity, or wind, sorry, moderate wind. And humidity, low. Uh, I'm a bit below there, but you know what I'm talking about. Low humidity. You must be very careful because examiners have this way of saying, describe those factors that increase or decrease. So if you give the wrong, if you give, if you give it just like this, temperature, light, wind, humidity, wind, you'll get the mark because wind on its own also increases the rate of transfer. But all the others, you have to be specific, like I have been here. And we'll use this other kind, pink, almost red, for decrease. Obviously, that will become low, that will become dumb, that will become high wind and high humidity. These factors will decrease the rate of transpiration. So you need to be able to select these facts from a given point there. This is what you have to answer in that one. This too can become an essay question in this slide. Good. Let's just go back to one more question and then we'll take your questions. Study the graph. This is a nice data response one. Study the graph below which shows the rate of transpiration and water. Rate of transpiration and water absorption in a herbaceous plant. For some reason, we're getting extended lines there. Okay, now notice in the graph, first of all, we had a heading. There's the heading here that tells you the graph which shows this here, right? Heading of the x-axis, heading of the y-axis. The x-axis, the independent variable. Time, 24 hours, you can put the hours. And here, the rate of transpiration or absorption by plants. Remember, there's two things here. This is two line graphs on the same set of axes, and we have to give a key for that when we're doing that. The solid line is the rate of transpiration. The dotted line is the rate of water absorption. 
Name three environmental factors which could directly inf influence the rate of transpiration from the leaves of the plant. We've answered that question prior to this. That is temperature, light. They just said name <coughs> three environmental neutral question. So you could give a neutral answer. They didn't say, oh no, sorry. Yeah, directly influence. They didn't say influence it by increasing it or decreasing. So temperature, light, humidity, wind. Those are the four fa environmental factors. Choose one of the factors that you have mentioned and explain why it would cause the rapid decrease in the rate of transpiration after 1600. Yeah, after 1600, we could use temperature. Because after 1600, the temperature, especially in winter, the temperature decreases tremendously. And a low amount of temperature would cause less water to evaporate Therefore, the concentration gradient between the leaf and the environment is not very high. Therefore, the less water will leave by transpiration. You notice the elaborate explanation there. Or we could even talk about light. Light is decreasing, less photosynthesis. Therefore, the stoma are getting closed now, and therefore, water is being lost less. So you could use any one of those. Remember, you must use something that's relevant. Describe what the plant might look at, at look like at 1400 and explain why. Now, uh, very vague in what it's asking, but if you look at 1400, what's happening with the rate of transpiration? It's very high, obviously. And that means the plant will look droopy because it has lost a lot of water. It doesn't look uh, solid anymore. It is not turgid. It is more plasmolized. It has lost water. Okay? So it's more in, in that uh, lump node, not lymph node, lymph, lymph. Give a reason why the rate of water absorption started to decrease in the late afternoon. What decreased first in this graph? The rate of transpiration or the rate of water absorption? The solid line, yes? And the solid line is the rate of transpiration. What did we say was the greatest force of taking water up the plant? Transpiration pull. So as water is being lost, Water is being pulled. So when the rate of transpiration drops, the force transpiration pull drops, and that is the greatest force. Therefore, less water will be sucked up the plant. Another thing that we like, used to like to ask was, why is transpiration a necessary evil? It's necessary because it must lose water to take water from the bottom because transpiration pull is the greatest force that we find. Looney, some questions. We're going to stop with those questions. We're going to take your questions because those for me are more interesting. Okay. We'll this come back to others if we have. Okay. This is from KG on Twitter. KG? What yes. What happens when water is lost through the stomata? What happens when lost water is lost through the stomata? Generally, when lost water is lost through the stomata, this is known as transpiration because water is lost by the form in the form of water vapor. When this happens, it has a pulling effect on the water in the xylem of the leaf, which in turn has a pulling effect on the water in the xylem of the stem and the root. Why? Because of the adhesive and cohesive forces that exist between water molecules. So when water is lost by transpiration, it pulls water from the root upwards. If too much water is being lost, this is no good, then the plant can pl become plasmolized, and if it carries on like this, the plant will wilt. It will become dry, shrivel up, and die. Okay. And then from Matsaleng Masiteng, does the process of transpiration take place during the night, or does it only take place during the day? Transpiration, from what we spoke about earlier, it will depend on the uh, stomata being open or closed. Generally, however, the stomata are more open during the day and more closed during the night because more photosynthesis takes place during the day. So less water will be lost. Remember that it doesn't mean that no transpiration takes place at night. There would be some transpiration, but there will be less transpiration taking place. Again, the temperatures are lower, the light is lower. That alone brings the rate of transpiration down during the night. Anything else? And then um, from Maseho Mangwane, what is humidity? What is humidity is the amount, the relative amount of moisture in the air. The higher 
content of moisture in the air, the more humid we say it is. The less moisture there is in the air, the drier or less humid it is. And when the humidity is high, that means the amount of water outside the plant and, out and the plant water inside the plant are equal or sometimes even in the balance of the outside. So therefore, transpiration rate comes down. Thank you very much for your questions, and I think with that, I hand you over back to Luni. All right. Thank you so much, Aslam, for the lesson. Mindset is at home. Thank you so much for tuning in and for watching. Thank you for interacting with us on Facebook and on Twitter. Remember to catch us next week, same time, same place, but from us, it's goodbye. And remember, guys, if we didn't get through your questions, the Learn Extra Life Sciences Help Desk is proudly brought to you by Axel. So please make use of it. Learn.mindset.co.za forward slash help desk. Goodbye from us.